Hello, everybody. Welcome. This is Rabbi Drew Kaplan. Welcome to the JewishRinking.com podcast and video series. I'm super duper stoked to have first time guest on Chaim Grafstein. I pronounced that correct? Yeah. Awesome. So uh, Chaim here is a PhD student at the University of Toronto studying Moroccan Jewish texts in the Department of Near and Middle Eastern Civilization. So Grafstein here, uh, his research focuses on perspectives on Muslims and Islam and the writing of Rabbi Yosef Massas and the halakhic and cultural implications of these perspectives. We are focused in this episode on a particular Moroccan Jewish beverage called, I'm, I don't know if I'm going to pronounce this correctly, Machia. Give, give it a shot. Machia, yeah. yeah. Machia? Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Chaim, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. All right. So it's let, let's start off with a very important starting off question, which is, what are you drinking? I've got a couple of options. I have one option here, yeah, which is uh, tamborjirt, also known as machia or uvi, uh, and then I also have something that might be a little bit more familiar to you, is arak. Cool. So, very exciting. Very exciting. Well, yeah. I very excited because I myself am drinking some arak tonight, so it's. Hey. Uh, and, and a fun, random little fact that very few people know about me is that when it comes to jelly beans, jelly beans are good, don't get me wrong, but black jelly beans far surpass any other jelly bean out there. So the, the my, I'm enjoying my Iraq. So, Chaim. Chaim. All right. So, so, yeah, so, if you want to if you wanna shift now into the Moroccan frame of mind, there's not just the Chaim, but there's also the which is health. Huh. So that's that's another cheers that you would make, and that would that would be one that you would make over this drink. All right, and, so what is that again? Can you say it again? Bisha. What is it? Bisha. 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 Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Bisha. All right. It's good. Excellent. All right. All right. So I, So let's let's start off with the very most basic question, which is sure. what is what is machia? And this is gonna be a great random question. What's his, Machia's relationship to Iraq? All right, so let's let's start off with what is Machia. Uh, the yeah. name Machia itself is a composite. It's a, a a Moroccan Jewish dialect and also just general Moroccan dialect Arabic word uh, that's a composite of Ma, which is water, very similar to Maim, and Hiya, which is life. So Maim Hayim, uh, life, or, water, or Eau de vie. Eau de vie, exactly. Eau de vie. So very, very common name for uh, drinks, uh, especially hard alcohol drinks. Uh, I mean, and same, same, ah, yeah. thing, same thing, by the way, with whiskey. I mean, that's where it gets its name from. Originally, it's a like a Celtic or Scottish whole phrase, meaning waters of life. Fantastic, yeah. So that, that rings true for uh, the Moroccan version as well. So... This uh, machia that I have here is actually from Morocco. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to start off with like a little, a couple of anecdotes uh, just to get the ball rolling. So when I, I was buying this bottle of machia, I was in Morocco and I was in a store. And you can understand that most stores in Morocco are not run by Jews. And in fact, they're run by Muslims. And I'm conventionally used to going into a store in Toronto in Canada, North America, and walking in and going and seeing the different alcohol selections, choosing one to buy. And a common thing is you can ask somebody, have you tried this one? Is, is it good? So I made the, the mistake of being in Morocco, asking somebody, have you tried this? Is it good? And he absolutely freaked out. He's like, never in my life. He looked to his, his supervisor, says, I didn't do it. I haven't tried it. I didn't drink anything. <laughs> so like, there's, there's some good uh, story behind this, this one itself. Uh, and this one is called a tamrirt, which is, uh, if you recognize the shared roots in Hebrew and Arabic, tamar is the, the root as well. So it is a date-based uh, alcohol, uh, so that's that's machia. It, it can be made out of dates. It can be made out of other things. I'll get specifically into the interesting case, which is machia made out of wine and made out of grapes. And th this will come full circle with uh, that story that I just told you. 
Uh, the next one is you asked me about the relationship between Arak and Machia. Uh, so Arak is kind of like a come a catch all term for a lot of uh, North African and Middle Eastern uh, like hard alcohols. Uh, it has this very similar flavor profile as Machia. So that's, uh, that's going to categorize it together very easily. But uh, in Israel, if you uh, go to any store that carries like hard alcohols, you'll most likely find Arak, but you won't find Machia because Machia kind of gets consumed in Israeli culture. And what we understand as Arak in Israel includes also Machia as well. Mm -hmm. However, in North America, where the Moroccan community is kind of uh, center a little bit more on themselves and not just absorbing into a broader culture as much, you retain a lot stronger of a Mahia production culture. You get small runs of it. You get larger companies that are also producing it. And it, it kind of, uh, it has a life of its own in North America and also a little bit still in Morocco. Uh, and I presume also in France. I, I haven't been to France, so I can't comment on the state of Mahia there. But in Israel, Morocco, and uh, Canada, and the United States, it, it takes a, a different form in each of those places. Cool. So how, how is Mahia made? And what's, right, so, what's the history behind so, it? Mahia is a standard, like, hard alcohol. Uh, communities like to have hard alcohols. It's, it's great. It's delicious. It uh, serves a purpose. Uh, if we if we're gonna just do the technical history of it first, and then I'll get into a little bit of the uh, some of the complications of the history of Mahia in Morocco, and yeah. and we'll see some very interesting uh, cultural and historical data that comes out of the conversation on Mahia altogether. Uh, so Mahia itself is typically made out of uh, wine or uh, grape alcohol, more specifically, or date wine or it can be also fig wine, and you distill the alcohol out of those products in order to get the alcohol component, then it's infused with anise flavor, and you end up with the, the final product of Mahia. Fairly straightforward process, uh, nothing too exciting, but it raises a couple of interesting uh, cultural questions for Morocco. So I started off with that little anecdote of how I got this bottle. Uh, the rabbis of Morocco also were facing an interesting conundrum themselves because not everybody uh, does stuff uh, by the book and by the law. So uh, <laughs> there was a lot of mahia that was being made out of uh, wine that was produced by Muslims in Morocco and Algeria. There is a strong rabbinic history of discussing those products and there is a tendency to be lenient in that regard. Uh, the halachic reasoning behind it, I won't get into too deep, uh, but effectively the rabbis, on the basis that Muslims are pretty good monotheists and uh, Mahia has uh, switched from the state of wine to the state of hard alcohol, so it's not really the same thing as wine. So they were fairly lenient in terms of using machia that was made out of grapes that were uh, harvested and prepared into wine by Muslims. So, so that's an interesting point. I, yeah. I definitely want to get into that. Can we put that later in the episode? Absolutely. I'm really fascinated by that. So, But mostly, is it mo normally, is it mostly made out of the dates and figs, or is it usually at least having a grape component to it? It, it seems to me that the uh, historical information indicates that it was presumably made out of grapes more often, uh, and only recently has it shifted more to dates and figs. Uh, likely just because of surplus, having lots of wine means that some wine goes bad. Uh, that doesn't mean that the alcohol in the wine is bad. It means that you don't want to drink the wine itself. So you can still distill the alcohol out and end up with a good product in the end. So it's, that, that it's, seems to be... Saying it's, it's a good way to save wine that's going to go bad anyways. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Like, I can, I can speak to, like, uh, more localized experiences of local mafia makers. Just a quick anecdote of uh, when I've encountered people who make, uh, like, small-scale mafia batches 
basically they're going out and they're buying up large amount of uh, very low quality wine and then distilling the alcohol out of it. They don't really even care about the wine. They're just there to get the alcohol, extract it, and then put it together in the final product. So uh, when it comes to that, there's, there's that element. Uh, yeah. So you mentioned some sort of historical perspective as having later on there was more there were different uh, different ingredients being added as far as the mm-hmm. ratios of the the grapes the figs and the dates w- roughly when did mafia come to come into being do you know anything about its history how did it come into being 19th 20th century maybe 18th or 17th even it it seems to be fairly early uh, every text that i've looked at i specialize in 20th century done a little bit of work on 19th century. Uh, so uh, I, I haven't looked that far back, but every place that I've looked when moving backwards, it seems to show up. Uh, so it seems like it's, it's likely a very old tradition. Uh, the, like many of the traditions that are built around minimizing waste, it's, it's a convenient, easy way to do that. It seems to be a, most likely an old tradition. I, I could I, be wrong. By the way, I really like that contextualization of minimizing waste. Do you think that really is sort of how it comes into being? Yeah, the, the same way. Uh, and I can speak more to this if we, if we talk about a little bit more of like the uh, way that mafia gets represented in rabbinic text. Uh, it gets categorized together with vinegar. So vinegar, which is made out of wine as well, is a way to minimize waste of wine. And you have a good wine and it just ends up going bad and now you have a you have good vinegar instead. So <laughs> the, the same concept will hold true for the Mahe as well. So uh, it, it appears alongside those kinds of issues. If we look to uh, like the Talmud, for example, we see alcohol and vinegar come together in Masahat of Zara. Uh, the, these these kind of food stuffs uh, are, are ten, tend to be in uh, general groupings. You mentioned earlier, you're talking about the story of, you know, it's, it's a majority, it's an Arab, it's a Muslim country in Morocco. So the Jews in making this, they knew they were a minority and it's not going to be necessarily consumed by the majority Arab Muslim population. So how did that sort of function? And I don't know how far back, even if you want to just focus on the 20th century aspect of how did this, drink function culturally, how did, how did mafia play into things? Sure, so uh, there's a complicated history of the relationship between alcohol consumption in Morocco for Jews really? and alcohol consumption in Morocco in general. Really? So yeah. uh, if, we, if we look at uh, a, another rabbinic source, uh, Yaakov Moshe Toledano, he has a great book called Nera Marav, which is his attempt at producing a history of the Jews in Morocco. Uh, he talks about some of the earliest Jewish communities in Morocco. And we're talking uh, like old enough that Purim was a relatively new holiday. Uh, and when it arrived in Morocco, there was a lot of pushback against the holiday. Uh, the, the holiday shows up and they're saying, what, what are you doing? You can't drink. Jews don't drink. Jews are forbidden from drinking. And this is, this is a story that's being told in a very specific context in like the early 20th century. However, it's, it's hinting at like some shared historical like traits between Jews and Muslims that is uh, fairly interesting. Uh, I don't know how much historical validity there is to it. There's a lot of historiographic analysis of Toledano's work that points to some of it being very accurate history, others being more mythical in their character. Uh, so he's, he's presenting this history of uh, Mahia and specifically alcohol in, in general uh, as a little bit more problematic even for the Jews. Now, how much of this was just his own moral impetus to say, Jews shouldn't be getting drunk. Like, sure, you can drink, but intoxication is forbidden. Uh, because he, he's concerned about like, the outcomes uh, in, in terms of political tension as well. If a, 
a Jew gets intoxicated three times, he says that these ancient communities would disqualify them from giving testimony in a court. So let's say somebody has been publicly intoxicated. They do it again. They do it a third time. Now they go into a court. They, their testimony wouldn't be accepted. I don't know if this is ever in practice, but like that shows a very weird perspective that we're not used to seeing when we're thinking about uh, Jews and drinking, where we assume that Jews are like very, not quite cavalier, but very okay with the idea of having four glasses of wine and considering that a holiday. <laughs> it brings up to me a very fascinating, both Jews and drinking and sort of that no, those notions within Jewish culture in Morocco, but also vis-a-vis -vis the broader Moroccan culture being also an Arab Muslim dominant culture, right? Yeah, so there's, I, there's tensions there. And there's yes. Also, uh, another, another cute example of how these tensions come forward uh, is uh, in the Haggadah Shel Pesach, Vais Kor Yosef, of Yosef Mesas, he actually writes uh, that the first misvah that you're supposed to do while preparing for Pesach is invite your Muslim neighbors over for the seder. That's a, that's a big no-no in the Ashkenazi world. You don't do that. That's not something that flies. Having non-Jews for the seder, that's absolutely unheard of. So there's, there's different speculative understandings for why he's suggesting this. Uh, one possible understanding is that, yeah, he's like genuinely interested in a pluralistic Seder experience. I'm not sure how much I buy that. It might be that he's like pushing back against uh, the Ashkenazi Sakalachas very intentionally, saying like, this is not something that we should do. We live a different culture. But I, I, I'm going to land kind of on a practical note. And I think he was uh, pretty intuitive. And a Pesach Seder involves a lot of drinking. And if you're as minority Jewish community, uh, you're going to be dealing with neighbors who aren't necessarily always going to be so friendly. So if you invite them over, at least they know that you're having the sit. Whether or not they say yes, that they'll come is one thing. They know you're going to be up very late. You're going to have four glasses of wine. You might end up having a couple glasses of, of mahia. Like, what other hard alcohol can you consume? You can't drink beer. Uh, so... <laughs> You have uh, this, this warning sign to your neighbors to say, hey, listen, we're going to be getting drunk. I know this is not something that you do, but we're going to be doing it. We might be a little bit noisy. At least you have your warning. Yeah. Wow. It's, yeah, it's an interesting versus, you know, it, it's broader context for sure. So what's... So you really, you really don't know how far back Mafia goes. It just goes back until, whom, whom, like, however far. I, I couldn't tell you. It's, just, it's not my area. I, I deal more with, uh, I can tell you, like, 20 things about it in the past 100 years. I couldn't tell you anything about it more than 200 years ago. Okay. All right. So how did you, let, let me, how did you find out about Mafia, right? So how did you find out about it? How did you decide to look into its production and, and where it fit into 20th century Jewish Moroccan culture. So I, I've got some pretty close connections with it. Uh, so uh, growing up, it was my grandfather's favorite drink. His, uh, my mom is uh, a Moroccan Jew, uh, so that makes me by blood also Moroccan. So I, I, in, I encountered Mahia from a very early age. It was one of my grandfather's favorite drinks. Uh, and my family in Morocco has a long history and ties with alcohol production as well, uh, especially uh, wine production in Morocco. Uh, and when I was doing some of the research for the exploration of the halakha of, of Mahia, mm -hmm. I actually found some historical documents that mentioned my great-grandfather. Oh, and wow. in, in the same historical document, his competitor, who was my other great-grandfather, and it led me to believe that maybe like my grandparents' marriage might have been a little bit more uh, of like a business merger than, uh, than just a, a simple, straightforward marriage. So, so I've got like a lot of connections to this. Uh, and uh, like, like I said, I've got historical connections. I have more recent connections with it. 
and is also just an interesting topic because it's an area of Jewish law that is a little bit unclear. We have a lot of very clear halakha about wine. We have a lot of clear halakha about other certain kinds of food. But uh, hard alcohol is not one where there's very strict delineated uh, legal applications. So like if I'm what? studying halakha, it's, it's, it's helpful. Imagine, uh, I think one question that's going to come up is Machia's fitness for Kiddush and Havdalah, right? Is that one area where it pops up? Uh, it doesn't, doesn't really show up. Uh, for Havdalah, I don't think it's a problem. For Kiddush, so, I... For, for, the 20th century, for the 20th century halakhic literature, what are the sort of the contested sites where mafia appears? Sure. So the, the major one is Stam Yenam. So like, like I had mentioned before, I, consuming alcohol that was originally wine, and that wine was definitively handled by Muslims, used by Muslims, presumably for their own consumption, mm. and now has changed shape and uh the this leads to the second area of contestation which is how much do we accept uh the changing of time like do we do we ex accept that it's a new food and the flavor changes and this it's losing the color it's going from dark red and being wine to being a clear distilled alcohol like if you can see here you couldn't really tell that this was once something that was dark brown in this case or in the case of a uh, grape-derived mafia would be a deep red. Uh, so that's another area where it appears in contestation. Uh, like I mentioned, a uh, question around the obligation to uh, consume alcohol on Purim also becomes a point of contestation as well. With Toledano's uh, history of uh, the Moroccan Jewish community, when Purim showed up on the scene in Morocco, it was a question of whether or not Jews were allowed to get intoxicated. So that's another point of contestion. Uh, like if, if it's simply like consuming wine in the way that we do for the Seder, where there's a shiur, there's a, a measurement of the wine that you need to consume. And presumably that's buffed with food and other things. But with uh, Purim, there's like an obligation to consume wine without a specific shiur, or, or the shiur is on the person and not on the wine itself. So that, that becomes a point of complication for the legal ruling. What, what sort of, what are the contours of that discourse? Like, how do people talk about that? Are they concerned about drinking too much? Uh, it seems like it's a concern with drinking too much. Yeah. It, it seems like intoxication is something as bad as a poor characteristic to somebody. Uh, so... Drinking within reason would be something that's okay, but then drinking in excess would be something that's uh, a little bit less uh, ideal. So, it's, so it's culturally acceptable. It, it's not culturally acceptable, and it seems to be the implication that this is not something that is due to a Muslim majority uh, culture, but it's a, a byproduct of uh, Tolzano is making a case for this older Jewish culture. And this older Jewish culture precedes the Islamic perspective on it being not something that's so great. And it, it ends up saying the same thing, but with a little bit more historical precedent. Wow. wow. And so I'm, I'm going to go back, backwards to what you were talking about, the great based mafia. Mm -hmm. So there were some post came, some, some Moroccan post came who said that it was okay because it had been transformed from basically a wine to this new, this new creation that was a distilled version of it. Yeah. So, so there's a uh, post scheme. And, and when we, when we move into these post scheme, we have to kind of take a shift away from Moroccan and start talking about uh, like the Maghreb, like North Africa, specifically Northwest Africa. So we're talking about Algeria, Tunisia, Libya, to an extent, and Morocco. So we're, we're talking about a large number of uh, Algerian poskim, so in a broader sense, Maghrebi poskim, who are saying that mafia is fine. Uh, this gets cited by Yosef Messat. They have, they have mafia also in like Jerba and Tunis, in, in the Jewish uh, There, I don't know as much from, from 
east of Algeria, but in Algeria we get a specific poskim who talk about it uh, and speak about it by name, and they uh, they suggest that this mahya that's made out of wine made by Muslims is totally fine. There's no issues with it, and drinking it is not a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, the, this perspective gets uh, consolidated by Yosef Misas, and he also adds on his uh, own take on it, which kind of gets a little bit controversial, where he says that uh, that Muslims have a better unity of God than Jews themselves. <laughs> so if we're worried about like Stam Yenam and Yayin Nessa, we, should, we shouldn't definitely not be worrying about wine that was handled by Muslims because that that is so far out of the the possibility to him. He's just like these the Muslims are better at believing in God than we are. <laughs> they, they have a better sense of the unity of God. So how can we possibly assume that they are going to be using this for idolatrous purposes? That's pretty interesting so that fasting perspective on the INSF or even Stamina. Yeah. Wow. And and when you combine that with the fact that the it has changed states, gone from a certain color and taste to a different color and taste, it compounds into a, a pretty strong case for Mahia being fine from any source. Yeah. Because it's no longer wine like it was that's necessarily even fit for libating. It's been tra literally transformed. <laughs> literally. Not yeah. only in taste, in in the color, but like literally everything about it, pretty much. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and he also uh, goes on in a separate area where he continues to talk about mafia. And he kind of, he's got this cool way of sneaking stuff in under the table uh, oh. where, where he's talking about mafia and he's saying that, of course, it's fine. But he says, not only is it fine, but we have this custom in Morocco which is we drink uh, like non-halal Israel milk. We drink milk that's been produced by Muslims. And if that's, that's a given for us, then obviously this alcohol is fine. Oh, wow. So it's, it's an interesting point that kind of makes its way in there. And uh, I'm not sure on the specific dates, but I think it's fairly close to the famous North American Psa uh, Kalacha on, on uh, halal Israel as well. The Rav Amos Feinstein. Yeah, so it's it's a contemporary issue for him. Oh, fascinating. That's great to hear that they were in dialogue. So, so and then eventually, like, where is Machia? I I want to say in the world, meaning not only just in Morocco, but sort of in the Moroccan diaspora, both in North America, Israel, Europe, elsewhere. How, where 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 can it be found? Where is it being produced? Where is it being consumed? Yeah. So the, uh, if you want to look at Mahia as not just like itself, but also a, a marker of Moroccan Jewish cultural identity becomes a very important piece of that identity. It's like a distinguishing characteristic. It's like as significant as uh, like gefilte fish is to Ashkenazi Jewry, Mahia is to Moroccan Jewry. So it's a, it's a, a it's a beverage that is typically for kibush on daytime kibush. Mm -hmm. uh, it's fairly common. I so far my encounter with it at kibush has been in North America very often, uh, in Morocco as well, uh, and in Israel it tends to get consumed by Iraq. But the same idea is there, so uh, it it kind of fits the same role that Mahia would have served. Uh, additionally, like it builds a lot of uh, character and stories. A friend of mine was uh, getting married and I, I was meeting uh, her father for the first time. And her father was good friends with my grandfather before my grandfather passed away. And he, he was asking me a little bit about who I was. And he was just like, oh, your grandfather, I remember him. One time I remember being at Magen David, the local synagogue, and he drank half a bottle of Machia, and then he walked home for an hour, and he still wasn't sober, and then your grandmother screamed at him for an hour. <laughs> so 
it, it becomes a, a narrative device and it becomes a tool that people use and people use to communicate. You know, you, the same way that you would tell a story over a glass of machiad, it weaves its way into those stories as well. Uh, there's also a Moroccan Jewish music that appears. And this is not speaking to the piyotim and the bakashot, which Moroccan Jews are typically associated with, but popular music that gets produced. Uh, there's uh, a song by uh, Raymond Abekasis and Maurice Luski, which is Shkun, which is literally who is there. The story of like a drunk Jewish man who's come home. Presumably he's been drinking way too much machia and his wife is inside and he's knocking on the door and she's like, Shkun, Shkun, who's there? And he's like, it's me, it's me. But she's like not letting him in because he's really drunk. So it, it plays a narrative also in popular culture as well. So it, it kind of like spreads and, and fills that, that piece of Moroccan identity. Even while Jews are in Morocco, it's a way to distinguish against those who are not consuming alcohol. And then when they leave Morocco, it becomes a way of distinguishing against the other Jewish communities that they're encountering. So like we, we see in North America, it's preserved a lot better because Jewish communities in North America tend to insulate. They tend to move inwards. So they build these markers that are very clearly identifiable. And if you look at Moroccan Jews, they're going to identify off of the pieces that they have from Morocco. And something that you can take with you is food, drinks. So one of the drinks that they take with them is the machia, which gets preserved very well. In Israel, that kind of gets consumed and becomes part of this broader Jewish culture because there's no need to define against somebody else. There's the assumption that others are enough like you that you don't need to define yourself against them. I imagine Toronto and Montreal are big hubs, at least in North America, of Moroccan Jews. Anywhere else in North America? Uh, in, I, I know mostly Canada. A lot of my research has been, when I was doing ethnographic research, I was studying Toronto's Moroccan Jewish community. So I got to know the, the Toronto community. By extension, I learned a little bit about the Montreal community, as well as uh, a little bit the British Columbia, the uh, Vancouver community. Really? Uh, those are kind of the three biggest centers. Uh, Toronto is the highest concentration of uh, northern Moroccan Jews. So you're talking about Sfaradi Jews that are from the Spanish Inquisition. And then Montreal is more so the French-speaking Jews, which would be uh, the Toshabim, or more so the uh, Jews that were in Morocco before the Spanish Inquisition. Oh, wow. So you kind of get that split to an extent. Uh, colonization of Morocco yielded a couple of different identity shifts, but there were the Megorashim and the Toshabim, the, the people that were already there, and then those that were exiled. And then over time, those communities kind of preserved some of the, their identities, and then eventually French culture came with colonization and kind of shifted a lot of it. So you end up with like these lines kind of getting blurred and pushed in different directions. Uh, my family's origins in Toronto are uh, French Moroccan, which is the mi minority Moroccan Jewish community in Toronto. And because of that, it means that it's a very small insular community within a broader Moroccan Jewish community. The, the French Moroccan synagogue is smaller than the Spanish Moroccan synagogue a couple blocks away, for example. Like the, the amount of people there is, is much smaller. Uh, and that leads to a more insular community and uh, more of a preservation of certain like elements. So Mahia plays a much stronger role when I speak to people from that synagogue than when I speak to people from the Spanish synagogue. The Spanish synagogue, I kind of got big enough and it reached this critical mass where it didn't need to insulate as much as the French Moroccan community. So they, they end up with a little, a little bit of a, a different set of cultural markers and, and probably a few less cultural markers as well. I had no idea before this recording about the differences between the northern and the southern Moroccan Jewish communities and certainly not within their own diasporas, which is so fascinating. And, yes. and of course, it's Jewish freaking how Machia plays a role in their own sort of cultural preservation within their own diasporas. Uh, the, the Spanish Moroccan synagogue in Toronto uh, recently banned alcohol on their premises. They have a little bit of wine for Kiddush, and that is it. 
they, they've actually adopted Toledano's old position where this isn't a thing that should be done. Thank you so much, uh, Chaim. This was fantastic. This was great. This is insightful. I literally learned so much about Machia in this session. And I thank you so much for your time and your insights. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. This is a real pleasure. Absolutely. Thank you so much.